Hi, I'm Andrew from Hawkridge Systems, and today I'm going to show you how I 3D printed a cutter body for a CNC mill right here on my Mark Forge Metal X. We designed and built and tested a cutter body for a mill, and I'm real excited to share with you guys uh, a lot of info about the whole project. So first thing, I'm going to talk to you about the prototyping phase, how the process works, how and why we designed a tool like this. Next, we're gonna to go to my colleague Breland. He's gonna show us what it takes to design conformal coolant channels, which is, in my opinion, what makes this tool really special and stand out. And then lastly, we're gonna cut with the tools. So we're gonna throw this on a mill that's uh, waiting in the next room, and we're gonna see how this actually cuts and how it performs, and we'll come back for a little conclusion to see how the tool is affected and how the material we cut uh, actually cut. All right, so first and foremost, why are we making a tool like this? Why are we 3D printing this? Well, there are companies that make cutter bodies out there professionally. You can go out, you can buy them off the shelf. You can even buy ones that look just like this off the shelf, and that's great. If you can get that at short lead time and a good material cost, then that's, that's a great way to go. However, a lot of times in manufacturing, people need custom tools, right? So this is when you need that custom tool where either you have to go to your internal machine shop to create it, or maybe if, you don't, if you're not lucky enough to have an internal machine shop, then you're outsourcing. And either way, probably presents some challenges as far as cost and lead time. And even if you have an internal machine shop and things are really the shortest lead time and cost possible, there's also another great benefit to 3D printing tools, which people don't always get, which is Machinists are retiring. Uh, somebody told me at the last straw I was, I was at, they said 100 to 1, Andrew. And I said, I know, I talk to you guys a lot. There's way more machinists exiting the field than entering. So if you wanted your machine shop to make a part like this, this is going to take some significant time. They've got to be there to machine it, to do some post-processing. And if you're 3D printing this, well, now it's going to the engineering team, right? So you're taking this weight off of your machine shop and it's now going to your engineers who can simply design and 3D print this. And all right, I guess we're gonna get rid of machine shops? No, not at all. No, CNC mills, lays, all that stuff is very important. As a matter of fact, you probably wanna do your most important parts on there that need to be the highest tolerance, that need the most um, care. And stuff that's lower priority, maybe brackets and, and other tools and fixtures, you can 3D print them now out of high strength composite and out of different metals. And that's a great segue, actually. Let's talk about the composite side because there was a prototyping step before I got to making this actual tool. And the prototyping step involved printing the part on our composite machines. I'm very lucky. I, actually, I also have a Mark Forged X7, other than uh, some off my shoulder here, other than the Metal X off my, uh, off my other shoulder. So because that machine is high precision and prints great parts with great surface finish, I can make my prototypes out of plastic and I know that it's gonna to translate to the metal side uh, because the machines are that accurate. So that's how we started off. This was our first test print. We made a little prototype. And good thing we did because we very quickly learned that the carbide tips we had bought did not line up properly. They were a little different than what we thought that they were, a little confusion there. And also the bottom of the part does not attach to the mill in the way that we thought it would. So we printed a second prototype after making some modifications. And lo and behold, the second time the carbide tips fit perfectly and we were able to tell that the bottom is gonna work as well. So now that we prototyped in plastic and this is a carbon fiber reinforced plastic, then we moved on to the metal side and then we print the part on our metal X. So this is what's called the green part. The Metal X prints an exotic material, which is uh, powdered metal, wax, and polymer. And it's a three-step process. You print in three ingredients. Then the part goes into a wash station, which dissolves the wax. Now you're down to two ingredients. Then your parts go into a Sinter furnace. Here I have Sinter 1 from Mark Forge. This is the smaller version. They go in, and when they come out, the polymer is vaporized the metal particles have fused and now you have 
real metal metal. But this here, the green stuff, this is fragile. I mean, I, I could break this very easily. It's almost like clay before clay is fired. So yeah, uh, print, wash, and then sinter. And this was the result. And there were actually a couple extra steps after that. If you really want to make a cutter body that's going to be professional and it's going to compete with stuff you can buy off the shelf, it's important that the tips hit the part all at the same time so it's very balanced. So we took an extra step and we actually machined off the bottom of this just to make a nice flat surface, just took a few passes on it. And we didn't on this version, but probably if you really wanted to, to get uh, serious with it, probably be a good idea to machine past the uh, carbide tips. But to be honest, this is a sales sample. I'm just gonna be carrying this around. We are gonna put this on a machine and cut with it, so it does have to be functional but it's only gonna survive probably a five minute cutting process. Um, so I, I wasn't too worried about putting that extra work in. Plus here, our machinist work is a little limited. We do not have unlimited uh, ability to do that. So anyway, we, we uh, grind to the bottom, might wanna think about grinding behind the tips. Now, cost and lead time on a part like this, right? That's probably a big question that folks have at home. Well, to print this part it takes uh, one day flat. So I start this at you know, 9 a.m. one day, I come back the next day, it's done, but that's only part of the process. Then it would go into a wash station overnight, and then it would go into the center furnace, and that process is about 27 hours, so that's another day. So you might conclude that you can make one of these parts in about three days, which is true, but in reality, your strategy is probably gonna be a little different. Uh, I would imagine you're probably making multiples of certain parts. So if I wanted to make three of these, I can print in three days and then wash on the fourth day and then they're all done, center on the fifth day. I think by day six, I've got three of these. So it depends. There is um, an advantage to, to printing more volume and not doing one at a time because you're going to batch into the wash station and then batch into the center furnace. And that's really the correct way to get the most value. Now in material costs, this is about 50 bucks, so it's nothing crazy. And the other cost would be the wash station. It's almost negligible. It costs us 100 bucks a month to keep it running, and we put a high volume of parts through there. The center furnace has some cost to it. So if you amortize the filters, the electricity, the gas, everything that goes into it, it costs right around 100 bucks every time I turn this on. So if I'm gonna print three of these, I could easily fit three, maybe four if I squeezed it, not really sure. Let's say I can get three. So that's gonna add about an extra $33 worth of cost. So all in on this part, I'm gonna be about 85 bucks. And then the carbide tips as well are gonna be extra. All right, to take a, a look at what it takes to design the conformal coolant channels that run through this part. Yes, I said that correctly. So most mills, run the coolant externally. We've designed this part to have some holes that go through the center. The coolant goes through the center to cool the tool, breaks off into seven snaking S channels. Every one of these tips has its own channel that runs through the center of the part, uh, taking the heat out of the bottom of the tool, kind of snaking around the bottom and then coming back up to shoot right out at the perfect point. Now, unfortunately, we can't test the internal conformal coolant channels here. They don't have a setup like that, but I'm gonna put this in the sink and see if we can't uh, turn this into a shower head. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> oh God. But to talk more about that and how these channels were designed, I bring you my colleague Breland Blake, passing the baton. Breland, tell us a little bit about what you did on these internal channels. Thank you, Andrew. Now we'll hop into SolidWorks and take a look at our model. Uh, to get the model ready, we added some new features and we had to tweak up our model a little bit just to make sure that we would have the best 3D print possible without too much post-processing. With that being said, we had to smooth out our sides a little bit and we cut out and trimmed out some of our sides to make sure that our overhangs didn't have to have any support, uh, which would result in a fair amount of post-processing. Um, so we did trim down our sides a little bit and make sure that there's all nice smooth contours going around the outside edge of our of our cutting head. Um, also, we took a look at some of our facets. 
we reduced some of our facets as, as much as possible and our rounds just to make sure everything was nice and smooth. We didn't have any sharp edges or burrs or cause any kind of uh, print issues. We increased the seat for uh, carbine cutting tips to make sure that they're um, a better fit for just more common cutting heads that are replaceable. We also increased the hole diameter for our bolts um, because all these cutting heads could be uh, bolted in and removed um, if we have it, ever have any issues or have to replace any of the, the carbide tips. With that in mind, uh, we were going to, we want to present ourselves with a really nice model. We didn't know how exactly we want to display it. Maybe it's some of our shoes we want to have, maybe some of the, um, the cooling that we incorporate into the, the head um, displayed. So we're thinking about maybe put some kind of cooling or maybe hose up through the bottom to show how that's going to actually work. What we did is, um, at the bottom of the model, we added these two ports here. These are cooling ports, where the uh, cooling fluid is actually going to be pressed through the bottom, forced through the bottom inside of our, our cutting head here. And um, then we ester, we did some, just some uh, swept cuts in, in place. We had actually a teardrop shape just to make sure that we didn't have any overhangs. Um, have any kind of support in, internally that we couldn't remove. That's very important when you're 3D printing. You can't get inside and remove the support, so we have to make sure that we we added the correct kind of shape and geometry where we wouldn't have any of that uh, post-processing involved, which we couldn't get to if it was inside the model. So we came up with the teardrop. Um, the teardrop is going to be this connection going to be the exit hole on the top here. And then in the bottom here, uh, they have two ports that are going to come up through the bottom of the part. And then they're going to S through the internal uh, portion of the uh, of the cutting head, and they're actually going to exit out right where the carbine uh, cutting tips are at. So it's going to do two sources of a cooling feature for us. So we believe that worked out pretty well. Um, let's see. From there, um, we just had to, you know, of course, go around our, our new cutting seats and make sure everything was nice and smooth. Uh, make sure that we didn't have any. We put the model back into Iger to make sure that we didn't have any other um, support issues internally to make sure everything was nice and smooth and ready to go and present a really nice print for us. And we'll pass the baton back to you, Andrew. Awesome, Breland. Thank you so much for sharing with us a little bit more about what it takes to design conformal coolant channels in SolidWorks. All right, with no further ado, let's see if we can cut some metal. Okay, so I'm standing here in front of a Haas VM2 3-axis mill, and we're going to use our cutter body to cut some aluminum. We're going to start off with some lighter cuts around 1,000 RPM and 49 inches per minute to do some, some surface and a few thou. And then we're going to step it up to 1,260 RPM and 34.3 inches per minute to do some deeper cuts. Wow, that was exciting, and, and I mean it. I, I was quiet during the video. I had my mic on, so I was quiet, but I, I've been uh, wanting to cut with this tool ever since I printed it. So I was watching, just you know, cheering it on. A lot of fun. So just to recap, we talked about design and prototyping, 
then 3D printing and post-processing. Then we actually cut with the tool. And I'll tell you, looking at it, you know, there's, there's some evidence that it was used, but everything is fully intact. So this was a really positive test for the tool. And as you can see, our block of aluminum is a little bit shinier now. We started just with some surface cuts, then we went to 5 thou, then we went to 15 thou, and then we went up to 30 thou. And if you listen closely to the video, you can hear the operator saying, wow, that thing can cut. <laughs> so I think the operator was pretty impressed too, who's used to dealing with more traditional cutting tools. So look, thank you for watching. If you like it, then like it. And if you love it, please share it. And if you have anything to say, leave a comment and we'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks for watching.